So, um, yeah, I'm uh, just here. Um, actually, I'm joined again between Macquarie and AAO. Um, so, talking about high resolution spectroscopy. So, Andy gave uh, an exhaustive introduction to spectroscopy, and um, Carolyn gave a very good introduction to multi object spectroscopy, and um, Sarah gave a wonderful introduction to integral field spectroscopy. So, a lot of what I'm going to talk about touches on these things. So, um, they've actually taken all the heavy lifting, and I'm just going to gloss over those things to a large extent. All right, so high resolution, high resolution spectroscopy, why, how, and where? So why would you want high resolution spectroscopy? What would you want to do with high resolution spectroscopy? What science cases would you need uh, to use high resolution spectroscopy in? Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how do you achieve high resolution spectroscopy. And again, that was covered in much greater detail uh, in depth by Andy uh, first thing this morning. And then I'm going to give a brief, brief overview of what some of the high resolution spectroscopic facilities are that uh, we can access in Australia and elsewhere in the world. Okay, so what is high resolution spectroscopy? Well, in the simplest level, it is getting spectra at higher resolution. Um, and what do I mean by high resolution? Well, here's a spectrum of a star at a resolution of 300, so it's fairly low. Resolution defined as lambda divided by delta lambda. So here you see a spectrum of a star at a resolution of 300. Now if we zoom in, that's generally considered low resolution spectroscopy. If we zoom in and we show a sample of that spectrum at a resolution of 2500, so again, that's lambda divided by delta lambda, um, you see there's actually some detail in there. Still, for most people, 2500 is pretty much low resolution spectroscopy. If you then take a huge leap in resolution to 40,000, you see, well, these little vague bumps and wiggles actually refine uh, into um, fairly sharp and fairly well-defined uh, absorption features and even an emission feature there. And then, if you go to an almost ridiculous extreme and go to a resolution of a million, which is only possible with some of the very brightest stars, including the sun, you can see that even each one of these individual absorption features resolves into multiple uh, features. So, with high resolution spectra, you get a really detailed look at the spectral features, um, and you can use that to get very accurate chemical or elemental abundance information, and you can also get great, much greater radio velocity accuracy. So, what do you want to use that for? Well, you've got, sorry, yeah. You've got extremely metal core stars, so some of the most metal core stars in the galaxy. Um, you can find that out with high resolution spectroscopy. Um, studying open clusters, studying stellar associations, studying globular clusters. This is studying stars um, to find out their detailed abundances. Uh, tracing the kinematic and chemical evolution of the galaxy, and potentially with EL ELTs, uh, even other nearby galaxies. So getting very precise rate of velocities and very precise elemental abundances. Same thing with dwarf galaxies. Uh, probing the interstellar medium, looking at the absorption features that are created as light from stars passes through the interstellar medium. Um, the high velocity resolution enables us to find uh, planets um, via their Doppler wobble. So looking at the reflex motion of stars, which again, if you have high precision rate of velocities, you can do that. Um, finding potentially planets via chemical signatures, this is still somewhat controversial, but it has been proposed that um, Stellar systems with planets have different, have different chemical um, abundance patterns to stars that do not have planets. Uh, the rate of velocity information tells us about binary or multiple <laughs> stellar systems. Um, similarly, you can find out about pulsating or variable stars by looking at how these stars are changing in terms of their rate of velocity. Um, jumping over to AGP stars, stellar nucleosynthesis, trying to find out how the elements in the universe are formed 
Well, if you can measure the elements with great precision in a range of different stars, then you can tell at what stage um, these elements are formed in cell evolution. And uh, similarly, studying atomic line formation, so essentially trying to test if we really do understand how um, the spectra, uh, how, to how to interpret these spectra to determine the abundances of stars. Um, Doppler imaging astroseismology, this is a particularly cool one, I think, um, using very, very high precision rate of velocities to study how stars are actually pulsating, but also potentially even rotating, that you can actually make out um, bright or dark features on the surface of stars based on their varying spectra. And um, we can stretch a lot of this out to even as far as the LMC and the SMC, so 50 kiloparsecs, getting high resolution spectra of stars in the LMC and SMC. So there are a lot of science cases for which you would want to do high resolution spectroscopy. Again, coming back down to the two basic cases of wanting to find out um, the detailed abundances of stars, detailed elemental or uh, chemical abundances of stars, and getting very precise rate of velocities. So, as an example, high resolution spectroscopic abundances. So, the traditional way of doing this is you get, you um, want to try to measure the total absorption in an absorption feature. So, you've got like, a spectral line profile here. Um, you measure the equivalent width, which is um, the width in wavelength if the intensity went to zero instead of what that is. So, that's essentially, this is a measure for how much absorption there is. And then if you have blended features, so two features which are not distinguished well from each other, then you have to do a spectral synthesis. And so, for example, you can overlap your synthetic spectrum that you model on the actual spectrum and try to find a best fit. And for this, you need things like atomic data for lines, which generally come from laboratory work. Um, and also stellar parameters. You need to know the temperature of the star and the surface gravity or the luminosity of the class of the star. But using all this, you can actually measure abundances of, well, what to people who don't do stellar abundances would be weird elements like neodymium. So, how do you get high resolution spectra? Um, Andy talked a bit about um, a shell spectroscopy, so I'll just give a quick um, overview. So with a shell spectroscopy, you can look at, generally speaking, a single object in high resolution. And again, generally speaking, you see that spectrum, the resulting spectrum, as a two-dimensional array, and it generally provides large wavelength coverage. Um, here you see an example of this absorption feature, so that would be just like one of these orders. Um, here you see a high-resolution spectrum of the sun. Um, and I think that's probably H alpha if they had it color coded correctly. Um, so this color coding basically tells you, I mean normally when you see the spectrum on CCD there's no color coding, it's black or white, but this is just done to help guide your eye as to what's going on here, that this is increasing wavelength as you go up on the chip. So. Again, and you cover this in much greater detail. With in shell grading, you have um, they're operating at high angles in high diffraction orders, and light reflects off this um, short, steep face. It's a high glaze angle, um, and you get these high orders, and then they, generally speaking, fall on top of each other. So you have red light at 8,000 angstroms in order 71 is going to fall on top of blue light at 4,000 angstroms. That's coming from order 142. So to deal with that, generally speaking, people will um, disperse the light. You get a cross disperser. Um, it's often in the form of a prism. And then the cross disperser separated orders appear side by side on the detector. So here is in a shell spectrum that's been cross dispersed. So if you didn't have the prism to cross disperse it, all of these would be on top of each other and you'd have a mess. Um, and the only other way you could deal with it then would be to put some sort of um, separator filter that would only select a narrow range of light, like one of these orders. But with 
be a shell like this, you end up with a high resolution spectrum that covers a wide range of wavelengths. Um, so an example of this um, is the uh, veteran instrument UCLS at the AAT, which is still arguably the main shell spectrograph at the AAT, um, and it's formatted at the coup de focus. And here you see uh, a spectrum from UCLS. This would be emission line sources, and you can see many, many orders here. Um, so again, in this case, it's being cross-dispersed like this, and each of these orders, which appear vertically here, is a different wavelength range. So another more recently used technology, I wouldn't say necessarily newer, but um, is this volume phase holographic grading, these VPH gratings. And so these are transmission gratings, and they have a gelatin layer between two substrates, and you get a varying refractive index within the gelatin. So it doesn't have any grooves um, and you can get a very high line density, um, and you use these generally at high angles, and they provide high resolution and high efficiency. And these are not, I mean, shells, you can often adjust here or there. Generally speaking, these VPH gratings are very specifically manufactured um, for certain wavelength ranges. And an example of this, is Hermes, which is uh, another high resolution spectrograph and now more, much more heavily used at the AAT. And Hermes has four VPH gratings and four separate cameras. So the thing with the VPH grading is that you end up with a very specific wavelength range. You don't have all of these orders which you then separate out. You have a very specific wavelength range. So what you end up having to do is um, select some regions and then have each separate region with each corresponding to each separate VPH grading go to a separate camera. So, some of the trade offs in high resolution spectroscopy. Well, you might think, well, why don't we just go for a really, 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 really high resolution? Because then you can resolve everything and you can get ultra precise rate of velocities, etc. But the problem is that you're then spreading out, for a given object, you're spreading the same amount of light over more pixels, or correspondingly, you're getting fewer photons per pixel. So that means that for a given time, you're going to get lower signal to noise. Or flip side is you'll need longer exposures to get the same signal to noise. Um, another thing, narrower slit width could potentially get you higher resolution. But if your slit is smaller than your typical seeing, in other words, your object is spread out over a larger area than your slit, then you are potentially going to lose flux from your source. Losing flux from your source means lower signal to noise uh, or longer exposure times for the same signal to noise. So for example, with Hermes, we have a slit mask that we can put in place and it gives us higher resolution, but we're also losing light in the process. Um, another slightly, uh, another more of a camera design trade-off is when you want to go for higher resolution, and this is it's kind of a funny one to think about, you also need more pixels to record a given wavelength range. So if you go to higher resolution, you're only going to be able to observe a limited spectral range at a time. I mean, CCDs nowadays still have a <laughs> finite size. And so either you're going to be looking at a very limited spectral range at a time, or you're going to need multiple detectors to record all the data. You're going to keep spreading the light out so much. So, uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons why, for example, with Hermes, we have four separate detectors. So where do we have high resolution spectrographs available to us? So Australia has direct access to a number of these. The ones actually located in Australia include 
um, the a shell on the ANU 2.3 meter exciting spring. And with that, you can get a resolution. Again, resolution is lambda divided by delta lambda of about 25,000. Um, with uncles at the AAT, you can get uh, resolutions, uh, depending on the particular instrument settings you use, ranging from 30,000 to 100,000. And because it's in a shell, it has a large wavelength coverage. Um, at the AAT, Cyclops is a new uh, fiber feed to, a uh, relatively new fiber feed to uncles. So rather than using a slit with uncles, you're using uh, an integral field unit. Um, and what happens there is you put the integral field unit on a relatively bright star, and each of the fibers essentially gets a separate spectrum of the star, and then um, if you want to, you can add it up at the other end, but it ends up being that you get um, high resolution. It, it's in a way, it's almost like you're taking a very, very, a lot of very, very tiny slits and adding them up for a bright star. Um, I'll just mention in passing that A omega, I wouldn't really call it a high resolution spectrograph, but it can get resolutions of up to about 10,000, um, especially around the calcium triplet. Um, so, and it has multi-object capability. So for some people, resolution 10,000 would be high resolution. Um, and there is some overlap um, at resolution of 10,000 with some of the applications that you can do with high resolution spectroscopy. And then finally, I mentioned a few times Hermes. Um, the resolution is about 28,000 or 45,000. That's with that slit mask, which cuts down on the light. And it has four fixed wavelength channels and multi-object capability. Again, um, 392 fibers. And uh, again, Hermes, generally speaking, we're using Hermes in the 28,000 mode because we want all the light we can get. <clears throat> so focusing on Hermes, again, four channels. This is a very nice uh, spectrum of the sun taken during Hermes testing by Gandhi de Silva. And you can see there's a range here in the blue. Um, and here's H beta. Um, there's a range here, we call it the green channel. Um, here is the red channel with H alpha, and then here is what we call the infrared channel, which has some really unpleasant atmospheric bands in it, but the reason we chose that channel was to get some very specific elemental lines, um, which are only in that spectral range. Um, and so each, again, this is not complete spectral coverage like you might get in, in a shell. This is four very specific separate channels, each of them about two to three hundred angstroms, and then you get about a thousand angstroms total. And um, for a star with a V magnitude of about 14, you get a signal noise of roughly 100 per resolution element in one hour. So that works out to about 10 percent efficiency. Now you might say that's horrible, um, but for a high resolution spect spectroscope, spectrograph, that's actually pretty respectable. Um, and the design is to measure over 20 elemental abundances per star. That's why these specific wavelength regions were selected, um, in order to get uh, absorption features from uh, over 20 elements, and potentially 29 elements, uh, distinct elements. And the Galois survey, which is now well underway, is planned to observe 1 million stars in the galaxy. Right now we're at about a quarter of a million. So outside of Australia, um, Australia has direct access to Magellan with Mike and MMFS, and the resolution ranges from about 20,000 to 80,000. Um, red and blue channel wavelength coverage and multi-object capability. Um, we have access to Keck high res which is a single object or slit, um, and that has resolution again, uh, depending on what settings you choose, of between 25,000 and 85,000. And some other facilities around the world to which we do not have direct access, but you can either get open access to or just find a friend, um, are things like uh, UBS VLT. Well, ooh, sorry, miss, I re that's left in from an old talk. Keck High Res, we have direct access to now. Um, HARPS on the ESO 3.6 meter, um, which is extremely high resolution. Um, high resolution spectrograph on Subaru, 
Hectoshell and the MMT, Win and Hydra, and there are a number of other facilities, which, of course, I am not mentioning. So, what about the future of high resolution spectroscopy? Well, one uh, instrument which is funded and I believe is in either past or near design review is Veloce. So, Veloce is designed um, in a way to re re replace Uppals. It's going to be high resolution, um, extremely well stabilized, red optimized spectrograph for the AAT. And it's going to have the target's image by an IFU selectively image slicer. Again, it ends up working out like you've got a whole bunch of little teeny slits. Um, and there are some additional cameras planned. There's Veloce Verde and Veloce Azzurro. Um, so green and blue. If you ever believe green and blue wavelengths, respectively. Um, and no, Veloce, I don't believe, is in any way uh, an acronym, because Christine hates acronyms. So this is being built. Ghost, which um, I believe Andy alluded to, is going to go on Gemini, and this is going to have cover a wide spectral range. And I believe the design is to be able to observe potentially two objects simultaneously with two separate IFUs. Um, or you could observe one object at high resolution. And again, in this case, the targets are going to be imaged by IFUs. So it ends up working out, like I said, like, like you've got a whole bunch of tiny little slits on your target. And finally, Foremost, which again, Andy mentioned. So Foremost um, is going to be a whole spectroscopic facility. It's going to be a telescope dedicated to spectroscopic surveys, if you will. Um, they're turning, they're going to take the infrared camera off the ESO Vista 4 meter in Chile and they're going to build uh, this whole spectro spectroscopic facility. We're building the uh, echidna fiber positioning system. Um, so that's Australia's participation in it. And the goal, which, you know, again, everybody gets enough money and everything works out, is to have roughly 2,400 fibers. Uh, in total, there'll be 1,600 feeding low resolution spectrographs, uh, real low res being about 5,000, but then about 800 fibers feeding high res spectrographs. Um, and high res in this case is roughly 18,000. And this facility is going to be used primarily for a bunch of simultaneous galactic and extragalactic spectroscopic surveys. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know whether it's going to be entirely surveys, but that's certainly the main use of the, the uh, facility for the beginning. Um, and it's going to be very interesting because they're going to be doing the targeting for both. I mean, they'll both be going on simultaneously, so the targeting is going to be very interesting for 2,400 fibers looking at a combination of galaxies and stars and all that kind of stuff at the same time. And I will wrap up that. Um, we do have time for a few questions. So, are there any questions for us, Dan, yet? Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, nice talk, thank you. So, I was wondering, like, in the... Um, <clears throat> for her, you said the efficiency is about 10% uh, when you observe a spectra. And when you come to the future instruments, like the ones if you use a two-way mirror to split the beam into like a uh, red and blue end, for example, or like uh, do some other fancy stuff observing the like different parts. Has uh, techniques been discussed to improve the uh, efficiency of the whole process? Because ten percent itself is low, so they're just gonna break out the light further. Um, I'm not. I'm not an expert on instrument design, but I don't know that there are any technologies currently being explored that create a great improvement over 10%, 12%. Uh, I mean, the 10% is a natural uh, product of the inherent losses in coding, mostly. If you have 1% loss and uh, 40 surfaces, you end up with very little going through. Uh, that said, you know, people are constantly working on better coatings and better materials. There's bulk absorption in the materials, 
And the other biggest source of loss is um, in the gratings. Uh, the BPH gratings are actually uh, an improvement uh, in many cases over the reflection gratings. So I would say, you know, there's no silver bullet, uh, but people are continuing to work on Incremental improvements in many areas. Yeah. I should just uh, hit something on there, which is if anyone has an interest in any particular star, ESO has a lot of databases that are freely available. Uh, so UVs, HARPS, Eros data, there's also uh, lots of data available, uh, reduced already for you, just ready to grab and, and use. Uh, I'll, I'll yes, you, you guys have heard archives quite a lot in this meeting, so thank you for that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, archives, very good. Um, yeah. Time for maybe one more quick question? Okay, if not, um, I just wanted to maybe make a little. Um, uh, uh, I'm surprised you didn't mention the law. Um, so, speaking of um, chemical, yep, or, well, chemical tracking, so just maybe watch this space because um, interesting things happening. Um, everybody who's. Uh, I'm very, very excited to see what comes out of it as well. So let's thank uh, Dan again, and no TV.